Has Been Hotel is the current hotspot for animation discussion. After years of waiting, we've finally gotten to see the under slash overworld from Vivzy Pop's imagination on full display. With a bunch of brand new characters introduced and much more depth given to the ones we already knew from the pilot, this ensemble cast is one of the strongest in current animation. Which got us thinking, instead of just sticking to morality and such, how about we talk about quality? Oh, this will be fun. That's right, we're going to rank every major character in this season from worst to best. I'm Kifinosi with Wicked Binge, and this is the Has Been Hotel character tier list. For this video, we'll be moving from our least favorite characters to the MVPs of the show, based on a mix of how well written we think they are and how entertaining and likable they are as a whole. We'll be trying our best to keep personal biases to a minimum, but, you know, no promises. Let's begin with the characters who just don't click with us, whether they're not super likable or they just don't contribute much. This is the D tier. Oh, tasty. Our bottom ranking character is one who fits both of those categories, Mimsy. Alistair's showgirl friend introduced in episode 5. We feel sort of harsh for this since Mimsy is definitely the most likable character in our bottom tier, which spoiler isn't saying a lot, but for a character who plays a decently large role in her debut appearance, Mimsy adds very little value to the story as a whole. This is due in no small part to the fact that she only appeared in one episode of season 1, but okay, let's give her a shot. What did Mimsy contribute? Well, she ruined the Hell's Greatest Dad music number with her out of nowhere entrance to the point where some YouTube uploads of it have straight up removed her solo, which pretty much everyone agrees is an improvement. She also endangered the hotel by leading a group of angry loan sharks right to them, which, as Husk asserts, is really the only sort of reason she ever bothers to visit. Really, there's just not much of a reason to like Mimsy yet, at least. She's self-absorbed without the likable characteristics that could otherwise carry her to a higher spot, so we have to call her the lowest quality character so far. In a similar vein as our next character, Katie Killjoy. One half of the news anchor team of Channel 666, while she's far from the most morally depraved character in the cast, Katie falls into the category of Mimsy, where she holds a lot of negative traits without really any good ones to balance it all out. At her best, she's mildly funny, and at her worst, which is almost all of her screen time, she's just really mean. If that weren't bad enough, Katie has less screen time throughout all of season one than she had in just the pilot episode. Talk about a downgrade. We guess that at least that means she isn't ruining any musical numbers. It's not enough to fix that awful track record, but it's enough to keep her from dead last place. Rounding out the lowest tier, we have the first of the Vs, Valentino. Let's get one thing clear. If this list were based purely on likability, or lack thereof, Val would be an absolute shoe in for the bottom spot. Which of these makes me look sexier? You know you've done a great job of writing a villain when the fandom pretty much universally hates him before even making an appearance in the main series. And rightly so. Valentino is a sex trafficker, rapist, murderer, and an all around brute with no qualities that are even close to redeemable. He's the most blatantly despicable character in the show so far, and it's not even a difficult choice. I own you, or have you forgotten that? It might seem harsh to place anyone beneath Val, but the reason he's not dead last is that we have to give him credit for the fact that, if nothing else, he's playing his role excellently. Valentino is a villain, and the fact is that when a character's meant to be evil or just plain vile, we can hate them all we want, but we can't argue that they're being written poorly necessarily, and okay, someone has to say it. The dude has style. He does not deserve a coat that fancy. <laughs> for my collection. <laughs> Now we move on to the characters who are just decent enough. While they aren't the best, the C-tier characters are perfectly serviceable. First in this category is the other news anchor, Tom Trench. Punching bag though he may be, Tom is by far the more likable of the Channel 666 news team. Well, and I'd sure like to nail her hot spot. <laughs> okay, we'll admit, most of that likability does come from pity. He can hardly say two words without being abused by Katie, whether there's a reason for it or not. And the guy is really just there. There is something morbidly funny about him being constantly mistreated for seemingly no reason, though. We're not sure if he's ever going to bust out of his role as a comic relief background character, but he's just tolerable enough to not be any lower. Now let's move on to Heaven's opening entertainment, St. Peter. He spends his days greeting new visitors to the City of Heaven, kicking off their stay with an upbeat song about just how happy every day is in Heaven. Now, granted, that's literally the only thing he's really done so far, but it's a start. Grab some popcorn, Serpentius. You're in for a treat. Up next, we have his superior, Sarah, one of many characters with presumably much more to her personality than we've been shown, Sarah got off to a rough start this season. She's introduced in episode 6, in which she hears Charlie's case for the rehabilitation of sinners, and, being presented with blatant first-hand evidence, she nonetheless responds by rejecting Charlie's plea. It is our job to ensure these souls are safe. 
While not particularly likable, there's still enough of a gray area to Sarah's personality to keep her from being a full-on antagonist or a truly despicable figure. Her approval of the exterminations definitely calls her morals into question, as does her senseless denial of Angel's rehabilitation, but she's sincere in her efforts to protect Heaven, even if that means kicking the sinners while they're down. Hopefully Emily can help her see the light in Season 2. If you thought Tom's screen time was limited, wait until you hear about Lilith. Given how we haven't seen her full face yet, outside of a family portrait at least, Lilith is definitely the most mysterious character we've been introduced to so far. In a show with lore as deep as has-beens though, that's definitely a plus. Her debut at the tail end of Season 1 has raised the stakes for Season 2's storytelling. You're going down there and stopping that the potential for fan theories here is limitless, which we may or may not be planning to touch on in an upcoming video. I don't know, stay tuned. Running out this category is the next member of the V's, Velvet. What she lacks in respect, Velvet makes up for with a cool accent, effortless style, and an independent streak that makes her stand out from the other overlords. Like her or not, you can't deny that Velvet is extremely confident in herself and her power, showing disdain for even the highest ranking overlords around in an effort to push them into war with heaven. You going blind, old man? While neither as despicable as Val nor as brilliant as Vox, Velvet's combination of influence and ruthless self-gratification make her an interesting antagonist, truly living up to her self-proclaimed status as backbone of the Vs. We're already getting into much stronger character territory, so it's time to move on to the B tier. While these characters definitely might not be MVPs yet, they show a lot of potential and are definitely going to be on our radars for future seasons. First up in this category is the surprisingly friendly cannibal, Rosie. Although she makes some cameos in the pilot, we're not properly introduced to Rosie until episode 7, in which she she's revealed to be a good friend of Alistair's. You can take that as our official apology for forgetting their friendship in our Healthy to Toxic video. Look at you, so polite. Alistair, you could learn a thing or two. In addition to that, she's also a good help to Charlie, assisting her in rallying the people of her town to help protect the Hasbin Hotel from warring angels. She's far from the most complex character in the cast, but the fact that someone with such an admittedly unsettling lifestyle is portrayed in an almost exclusively friendly light is pretty endearing. It goes to show that in this world, you really can't judge a book by its cover, or a, a cannibal by its eating habits. Next is an umbrella entry for perhaps the cutest of the Hasbin Hotel staff members, Kiki, Razzle, and Dazzle. Kiki Kiki is a shape-shifting kitty who just so happens to also be the key to the Hasbin Hotel. Sometimes all you need to be a memorable character is to be a cute animal who plays an essential role in the main focal point of the story. Who knew? I mean, you can't get into a hotel without unlocking the doors, after all. Well, you can, but we'll get to Cherry Bomb later. Razzle and Dazzle are noble steeds who help defend the hotel from intruders. You taking care of my widow girl? You better be. They can go from admirable baby goat-like pets to gigantic dragons who will smite anyone who dares to threaten their masters. May Dazzle rest in peace for his noble sacrifice, and may Razzle, um, I, I don't know, give, uh, give him a cookie or something. He's earned it. Speaking of adorable characters, next up is heaven-bound sweetheart Emily. Sarah's younger counterpart is by far the more likable of the Seraphim we've been introduced to. Unlike Sarah, she has a truly open mind and sincerely believes everyone deserves a chance to be heard out. When she sees Angel's good deeds at the nightclub with his buddies, she's so moved that she bursts into song to clarify that Charlie was, in fact, Right. Emily's sweet personality and goodwill have managed to endear us to her already, but her willingness to stand up for what's right, even against authority, is what makes us label her best of the good guys in heaven so far. Don't give up on this! I'll figure something out, I promise! She even celebrated Sir Pentius's redemption alongside the audience, and knowing her, she's probably not even going to gloat about it. We wouldn't falter for it, though. But while she's not nearly as pleasant, to say the least, loot the extermination angel lands a spot just above Emily. We hate to put Emily below the more depraved angels, but the fact is that Loot is, is just a solid villain all around. Acting as Adam's right-hand warrior and voice of reason, she's out for blood from the excess sinners, but even more so from Vaggy, who she labels as a traitor for sparing one of said sinners long ago. We're only placing Loot this low because she didn't get much time to shine in season one, since Adam generally took the spotlight as the main villain. Nonetheless, we can't deny that it's intriguing how Loot's arc in season one ended. This character who was already driven by vengeance now has yet another reason to seek it out that being the death of her good friend and comrade. We've got a feeling she's going to be one of the most interesting characters to watch unfold in the coming seasons, so she's earned a respectable place on our list regardless. Cherry Bomb is finally bursting onto the scene. We were actually going to put her in the A tier, but she, uh, she blew up one of our walls while we were recording this video, so that docked her a few points. Okay, jokes aside, are we that far off? Cherry's explosive in every sense of the word, from her personality to her character design, even down to her hobbies. Cherry doesn't get a lot of screen time in this season, and actually doesn't 
doesn't show up until episode 6, but her impact is still felt pretty strongly. Her dynamic with Serpentius is both hilarious and weirdly wholesome, and her chaotic yet open-minded personality makes her a character who's unpredictable, yet somehow reliable at the same time. Her best attribute, though, is her loyalty to Angel Dust, from being willing to fight the exterminations alongside him to supporting him through good times and comforting him through bad ones. She's rough and tumble, but she's the definition of a ride or die. Even without truly understanding why Angel's investing in the hotel, she still supports him nonetheless. What weighs on our soul, old friends? Oh, just the fact that we can't play Zestial any higher. We'll acknowledge right now that yes, Zestial only has like five minutes of screen time this season, but if there's one character trope we can't get enough of, it's a character with much, much more to them than their surface level attributes. That could describe a lot of characters in this series, but few as aptly as Zestial. They purge all of hell for getting an uprising. Despite being the oldest overlord in hell feared by just about everybody around him, Zestial is far from the terrifying menace you'd expect him to be. In fact, the man is completely even-tempered. He never gives too much rein to his emotions, even when being disrespected directly to his face by someone like Velvet. If that weren't enough, he's also a good friend who allowed Carmilla to confide in him about her slaughtering an angel. Surprisingly, this was totally genuine. No overarching plan, no treachery, just a compassionate friend lending an ear to his struggling companion. Zestial, as far as ancient hell-dwelling overlords go, is a pretty nice dude, and we're definitely looking forward to seeing him unfold even more. But for now, his genuine likability is enough to give him our top spot in the B tier. We're inching into main character territory now with the characters who have the most fleshed out arcs and best uses of their screen time. These are the A tier characters. Certified Hell's Greatest Dad is visiting up next. Lucifer Morningstar wasted no time making a mark when he made his grand debut. To the surprise of many, or us at least, Lucifer is a shockingly nice guy, with a phone call from Charlie being all it takes to get him out of the house and depression. Lucifer makes a commitment to start anew with his daughter and to get to know her for real, all the while supporting her hotel. So far, he's proven to be loyal to that promise. He helps Charlie get a meeting with Heaven to make a case for the hotel with the Seraphim. I won't be able to go with you. Will you be okay? And in the final battle, when all hope seems lost, Lucifer shows up in the nick of time to proposition himself to Adam so he wouldn't destroy the hotel. And now, I am going to fuck you. Uh, oh, he meant I'm going to fuck you up. Why didn't he just say that? Wait, what did I say? <laughs> If you're struggling to crack the code to the next entry, we've got you covered. The Egg Boys are taking the next spot. These little guys bravely sacrificed themselves alongside Serpentius for the sake of protecting the hotel, except for one who seems to have survived during the finale, which earns them plenty of points right off the bat. On top of that, just... Look at them! They're eggs with top hats and funny voices. They're even kind enough to warn their friends about the reality of bank accounts being a scam made up by the shadow government. Bank accounts are a scam created by the shadow government! One day they'll listen, Frank. Whether you like it or not, we're placing Adam in the next spot, and just outside of the top 10. As despicable as he is, from openly describing exterminations as entertainment, to committing the nigh unforgivable act of vaporizing Serpentius and the Egg Boys, we can't deny that Adam managed to play the role of the season's main villain excellently. Adam is one of those villains who manages to be a legitimate threat while simultaneously being fun and entertaining. He's the definition of a love-to-hate character. You all should be worshipping me, you ungrateful, disgusting- One who has just about no truly good qualities to speak of, ironically, yet poses a significant enough threat to really keep it itching for his eventual takedown. Basically, if Charlie's the answer to, what if there were a Disney princess in hell, Adam is the answer to, what if there were a Disney villain in heaven? Granted, that's probably a question even fewer people were asking, but we're glad it got answered anyway. He may be a loser, but Husk is a solid enough character to kick off our top 10. This eternally grumpy bartender proved himself to have a heart of gold in episode 4. While his repeated callouts of Angel's fake persona might seem mean at first, it turns out they come less from a place of resentment and more from a place of genuine sympathy. I can handle myself. You might need a bartender to talk to. Loser Baby is arguably the best musical number in the whole show so far. Through its hilariously blunt lyrics, Husk reaches out to Angel to let him know that he's not the only one who's hit rock bottom and is enslaved to a total psychopath. Good talk, my good man. Always nice to catch up. From here on, the two form a genuine camaraderie, and Husk starts to open up just a little bit more to supporting the hotel, showing enough loyalty to stick around even when he briefly believes Alistair is dead. But when it comes to supporting the hotel, Charlie has few 
allies greater than Vaggy. Charlie's girlfriend truly acts as the yin to her yang. Vaggy is short-tempered, realistic, and never shies away from speaking her mind. At the same time, she has a soft side and sincerely wants to support and protect Charlie and her hotel no matter what. We later find out that the reason for this isn't just surface level though, it turns out that Vaggy is actually an extermination angel who is left to rot in hell for sparing a demon child. Filth like you has no place in heaven. It's a tragic origin that really sheds a new light on her inner frustrations, and we're definitely interested to see where her story goes from here. It's clear that she supports the hotel not only out of love for Charlie, but out of conviction for just how despicable the higher-ups in heaven can be. That said, many of the other core characters have a bit more of our attention right now. One of those characters being Nifty. She is a hyperactive, unpredictable force of pure chaos who's sure to make you either laugh or shudder in fear every time she's on screen. She strikes that perfect balance of cute and cuddly and absolute menace that we love to see in dark comedy series. <laughs> Seriously, for someone whose soul is enslaved to a total psychopath like Alistair to not only be completely content with her situation, but to occasionally bewilder even him is impressive. Whether there's some deep lore reason for Nifty's bizarre nature or not, we wouldn't change a thing about her. Don't hide in radio or you'll totally miss our next pick. New villain Vox steps onto the scene. Acting as Alistair's business rival and arch enemy, these guys have more than their fair share of bad blood between them. Vox is a smooth talking, scheme toting television who takes every opportunity at his disposal to keep Pentagram City under his influence, with the help of the other Vs, of course. His tactfulness is made all the more apparent by his way of calming even the toddler-tempered Valentino down on his worst days. But all that tact is stripped away the moment Alistair becomes involved. At that point, Vox gets tunnel vision that demands focus on nothing but taking down that before-the-future radio host he sees before him. I'm afraid you've lost your signal. <laughs> While we doubt Vox is going to be overtaking him anytime soon, he's still a formidable foe with quite a resume. The combination of such a calculated, intelligent leader and such a blatant flaw of a short temper makes Vox one of the most intriguing of the new characters in the cast. And let's bring in one more overlord to close out the A tier. Carmilla Carmine, angelic weapons dealer. Being the first overlord to kill an angel, she used her newfound knowledge to foster her own angelic weapons to fight against them, but Carmine is far from a mere advocate for war. In fact, she openly opposes Vel of its insistence upon it, knowing that the wrong minds holding the knowledge of how to kill angels would be disastrous for hell as a whole. Unfathomable as it may sound, here we have an overlord of hell who has a genuine moral compass, to the point where she struggles to come to terms with killing, even in defense of herself and her family. Ultimately, she even helps protect the hotel by giving Vaggy training in fighting angels and providing the gang with a plethora of weapons. Carmilla is almost undeniably the most heroic overlord in hell, and we hope to see her remain an ally of the hotel in future seasons. Entering the top five, we have the S tier characters. For us, these are the characters who managed to totally steal the show. Leading lady Charlie Morningstar is our first top tier pick. Writing a character who's pretty much pure good is a risky move. If you don't do it carefully, you can get a character who seems like a Mary Sue, or perhaps even worse, boring. Thankfully, Charlie falls into neither category. She's a chronic people pleaser who's called out on her need to appease others multiple times throughout the series, which often gets her, and said others, into trouble. That said, Charlie remains lovable precisely for these faults, because at the end of the day, she genuinely genuinely means well for everyone around her and approaches them with an open mind. No matter how many messes she causes, they're always made with good intentions, and you can bet she'll stick around to clean them up. I just wanted to help you. Well, you ain't! From redeemable sinners like Angel and Serpentius to absolute scumbags like Adam or Val, Charlie's willing to give anyone and everyone a chance, not to mention that she's got a really good singing voice. In fourth place, we have the final pet of the Hasbin Hotel, Fat Nuggets. This is the face of a creature who's comforted Angel through ages of trauma, through thick and thin. You might wonder how he's ended up so high despite his minimal screen time, and the answer is simple. Look at him. This is peak adorable character design. There's no reason a character native to hell should be this cute and this cuddly, yet here we are. Frankly, he's only even outside the top spot because we felt like judging him against the others would be downright unfair. When asked what he thought of his top tier placement, Fat Nuggets had this to say. Wise words from a wise pig. We're entering the top three now, and the bronze medal happens to go to the last entry's owner, Angel Dust. Moment of honesty here, we weren't totally sold on Angel from the beginning. While his overly promiscuous personality could be fun, at other times it could feel, like, a bit much. That said, Angel's character arc does an excellent job of fleshing this out. His mask of hypersexual narcissism is a coping mechanism for the abuse he suffers at the hands of Valentino, and really his job in general, which he opens up about in episode four. This episode in general elevates Angel to a whole nother level, and we can actually see that growth reflected in the episodes that follow. Out here, 
I get to do what I want. Sure, Angel is, is still Angel, but he's different. He's more outwardly compassionate to others, no longer feeling like he has to constantly wear a mask. He unapologetically accepts himself for who he is and shows great progress on his path to redemption. He becomes strong enough to even stick up to Valentino before he gets nifty in his clutches, and in the last episode of the season, he saves an egg boy from an extermination angel at the last moment. He also brought Fat Nugget into our lives, and for that alone, we owe him a lot. Angel Dust is a highlight, to be sure, and if we haven't said it enough, he's not the only one who's addicted to to poison. The silver medal goes to an even better redemption arc, Serpentius. It's funny how the most outlandishly diabolical character in the pilot episode became one of the most endearing and sweet ones in the proper series, but Serpentius's elevation from a joke villain to a sincerely redeemed friend is just what the world needed. Seeing his legitimate remorse turns an already endearing character into an even more endearing one, just in a different light. From episode 3 onwards, we see Serpentius slowly but surely change his ways, genuinely enjoying his time at the hotel and bonding with his new friends. All of that isn't even mentioning his most prominent trait, dude's freaking hilarious. Not so cocky now, are we? From his reactions to the Egg Boys' insane ramblings to his impressively awful bouts of flirting with Cherry Bomb, there's never a dull moment when Serpentius is on screen, and he goes out with a bang. Despite being vaporized by Adam, he still ends the season on a high note by appearing in heaven to the delight of Emily and bewilderment of Sarah. This was the most satisfying, touching moment in the whole show for us, and for many others too. Charlie has proven right. Serpentius Serpentius is finally rewarded for all of his hard work, and most importantly, he'll be in season two. Serpentius is awesome, but... Okay, call us cliche if you must, we just can't give the gold medal to anyone but the radio demon himself, Alistair. Indie projects really have a way of making some of the most entertaining, intriguing villains out there, and Alistair is no exception. Yet despite being a serial killer, overlord, and all-around psychopath, Alistair is somehow not a full-on villain. He allies himself with Charlie, helping her with the hotel in any way he can, for unknown reasons. No, I'm here because I want to help! Sure, he says it's for ongoing entertainment, but you can tell that the longer he's there, the more endeared he becomes to the staff, particularly Charlie herself. Alistair never fails to be entertaining throughout the series, never is there a dull moment with him on screen, and the season finale only intensifies our interest in him as a character. Al nearly gets killed fighting Adam to protect the hotel, leading to a mental breakdown in which he reveals that he himself is enslaved to someone else and is hungrier for freedom than ever. This guy really had a mental breakdown because he started to care about others, but at the same time, we genuinely feel kind of bad for him. While he's almost certainly not going to be a good guy, there's just so much to unpack with Alistair. Who gave him his powers? Who Who's keeping him on a tight leash? Does he really care about Charlie and the others, or is it all just a farce? On top of all of that is a fun character design, a fantastic vocal performance both in and out of song, and a character who manages to be as fun as he is intriguing and menacing. So Alistair is our favorite has-been hotel character, but we'd love to see you broadcast yours down below. We're not pulling all the strings after all, or are we? No, we're not.